Uh, Paul, Paul Tillich is probably one of the most influential theologians of the 20th century, even if his name is not as well known as some of the other greats of the 20th century. And partly I think the reason for that is that Tillich's view is very much that theology has to be done in dialogue with the contemporary moment. And of course, once one adopts that sort of approach, then it's inevitable, perhaps, that one is slightly therefore left behind. Um, in fact, one of Tillich's um, commentators has, has talked about a planned obsolescence to Tillich's works, which I think is perhaps a slightly unfair way of putting it, but gets the point that Tillich's idea, central to Tillich's, Tillich's thinking, really, is that theology must engage with the contemporary. Tillich was born in 1886 in uh, a village called Star Sedel, which was at that point in uh, Germany, in Prussia. Uh, it's now in Poland, just over the border, and it's very much in that kind of uh, border country. Um, and the, after, after um, I think, about age about 15, Tillich moved to another town, again in East Prussia, in that area. And these are places which have historically shifted between German and Polish. Um, and th that figure of, of the boundary is something that is quite important in understanding Tillich. It's the title he chose for his own autobiography, On the Boundary. Um, so Tillich, as I say, was born 1886 in uh, East Prussia. His father is a Lutheran minister um, who becomes what is known as a superintendent, uh, which is essentially a kind of equivalent to a, to a bishop figure, um, and then eventually uh, moves to, to Berlin um, and becomes a reasonably prominent figure in Prussian Lutheran church. Um, he, for example, accompanies the Kaiser on a trip to, to Jerusalem. Um, Tillich's father is standardly represented as being a somewhat austere, old school, 19th century, patrician church figure. I mean, his, his interest is very much in the kind of more conservative figures of the, of the, of the 19th century. Um, and I think that's quite important in that Tillich is very much somebody who uh, is rejecting, stands against those kind of conservative tendencies. Initially, those of his father, and then subsequently, those of the more kind of established academic theology. It's pretty clear from very early on that Tillich is a bright child and is destined to follow his father into the Lutheran Church. Um, he studies initially in Berlin, then spends some time in Tübingen, um, and then Halle. Um, that's reasonably standard for theologians of that time, in fact it still is in, in Germany today, um, that studies will be undertaken in various different universities. Um, he is especially influenced in Halle by uh, someone called Martin Kehler, not very well known today, but uh, quite an important figure in his time. And Kehler was very important in the sense that he addressed the question of the historical Jesus. Um, in the late 19th century, the question of the historicity of Jesus was a, essentially one of the big questions. Um, you know, the, the idea of the quest for the historical Jesus and all of that. Um, and Kayla really says, well, a lot of that's really irrelevant. Um, the point is not whether a certain man, Jesus, existed and did certain things. The important thing is the impact that that figure had. Um, so in this contrast between the historical Jesus and the Christ of faith, Kayla emphasises the historical impact of the Christ of faith. And that's something that Tillich very much um, uh, uh, is, adopts and is very influenced by. So after his, well, in, in the midst of his theological studies, uh, Tillich became increasingly interested in, in, in philosophy. Um, he'd read 
uh, Hegel, uh, um, sorry, of course, um, he'd read Hegel, yes, but he'd read uh, Kant, more importantly, as a, as a, as a younger student. But it, it really, as the, his theological studies drew to an end, he, he became more and more interested in a particular figure, um, that is uh, the German idealist Schelling. The way Tillich tells the story, uh, he came across the complete works of Schelling in, in, uh, on special offer, uh, second hand in a, in, a, in a bookshop somewhere in the back streets of Berlin, um, and then bought them, took them home, and was uh, enthralled. Now, we, we have to be slightly suspicious about that in the sense that uh, Nietzsche tells a similar story about his discovery of Schopenhauer. There's a certain sort of uh, um, sense there that, that Tillich is um, already perhaps uh, mythologizing his, uh, his, his education there. But nonetheless, Schelling becomes absolutely crucial for Tillich. Schelling is uh, a, a neglected figure in um, the history of German philosophy. He's often thought of as a kind of uh, moment somehow be between Hegel and, and Marx and Feuerbach and the more radical uh, uh, young Hegelians. But Schelling is, a, is an important figure in his own right. And one of the central things about Schelling's thought is that he's constantly trying in different ways throughout his career, but he's constantly trying to synthesize what we might think of as um, the dialectic between the ideal and the real. Yeah, so between thought and being. Yeah, this, this idea that philosophy is primarily concerned with forming ideas, and yet these ideas must somehow be brought into, in, into interaction, into, into, into dialogue with uh, reality as it is encountered. Yeah. Uh, Schelling develops various kind of iterations of this. He, at one point, he develops a philosophy of nature, a philosophy of art, and then finally, in his later writings, a philosophy of revelation, in which the real is represented really by the, 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 the sort of, un, to use Schelling's word, the unprethinkable um, in, uh, arrival of revelation as something that is real, that can't, can't somehow be incorporated into, into the ideal framework. That dialectic between the real and the ideal is crucial for Tillich. So Tillich, say, becomes deeply, deeply influenced by Schelling. He writes his PhD dissertation on Schelling and then subsequently writes uh, a philosophical dissertation on Schelling. Um, and this is quite unusual. Normally, of course, uh, uh, people are encouraged to write on different topics. Uh, but Tillich writes, writes primarily, say, on Schelling in this period. And it, as I say, absorbs this Schelling's thought and this, this central question in, into his own thought. Another way of putting this, which I think is important for subsequent development of Tillich's own thought, is that Schelling is concerned with what he calls the unconditioned, yeah? uh, the um, unbedingt, the German word there, unbedingt, the ding is, is thing. Yeah? So it's sort of the unthinged, you know, the unthingly. It's always a risk to try and translate German words, especially proper theolog theological and philosophical German words. But anyway, so the, the unbedingt, the unconditioned, yeah? Uh, and, and for Schelling, the unconditioned is something that obviously must come before, beneath, beyond, above the conditioned, yeah? And yet is somehow to be encountered through the conditioned. Yeah. So we have this dynamic of this inbreaking of the real into the ideal of, of, of reality, being into thought, and also of that which transcends the conditioned realities, uh, somehow making itself manifest within the conditioned realities, and yet always through those conditioned realities. Yeah. So the other, the final kind of point here is uh, in, in Tillich's own development is that he rejects explicitly any notion of what he calls supernaturalism. Yeah. So the idea that one could somehow step outside of the conditioned realm of reality, of culture, of history, of religion, to come into some kind of direct contact with 
that which transcends it with God is just implausible for Tillich. Yeah? So theological thinking must take place within the constraints, as it were, of the conditioned, but always on the understanding that the conditioned is itself somehow transcended, somehow broken through by the, condi- the unconditioned. Yeah. So Tillich's um, theological and philosophical studies uh, were completed really um, in 1912, um, and he was then ordained um, into the Lutheran Church and took up a position um, in, in Berlin. Interestingly, uh, he was sent to a, an area called uh, Moabit, uh, which is now apparently quite a trendy area, um, as, as so many areas in Berlin are, apparently. Um, but w- at that point, it was very much a working class area. Um, and Tillich, of course, you know, the pastor's son, um, from you know, having, having studied theology and philosophy, very much concerned with abstract ideas, the unconditioned, the absolute, all these sort of things, yeah, then came into contact with... Uh, working class Berliners, um, and that that had a profound effect upon him. Um, and he he he's, he's said in his subsequent autobiographies that he was he was just not aware of the conditions of the working class in that in that time, um, and that subsequent that influenced his his own thinking, particularly the development of what he came to describe as religious socialism, um, and that's something which will be important in, in a later stage in Tillich's development. Um, for the moment, we can just sort of note that, that he, 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 he's struck by that, and by the need, again there, to bring Christian theology into dialogue with the situation of the people who are receiving it. You know, that the theologian must not just simply stand in the pulpit uh, on high, talking down to his audience, but must always be in dialogue with them. Um, so Tillich's time in, in Berlin, uh, say he he's, takes up this, this position, um, he gets married um, to uh, uh, someone called Greti uh, Weber. Um, there's a certain amount of debate about this marriage. It seems that uh, Greti is not particularly religious, doesn't have much time for religion, um, and nonetheless, uh, Tillich goes ahead with this. Um, but within a few weeks of his marriage, uh, he, he leaves, he voluntarily signs up to be an army chaplain in the First World War. And this is often said to be an enormously important moment in Tillich's life. He leaves the security of, of, of academic theology to become um, uh, uh, an army chaplain, and he's on the Western Front, um, and eventually he ends up in Verdun. And as we might expect, this is uh, uh, an absolute um, transformation for Tillich. He he says that he starts off by preaching um, uh, consolation, by preaching that the war is um, justified in terms of a defence of the fatherland, a defence of German culture, of course, culture with a capital K. um, But he ends up by, as in his own words, preaching only of death. So the, 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 the reality of the breakdown of the 19th century certainty of Lutheran theology aligned to the interests of the German state, of the whole idea somehow of this cultural, religious situation, that, that, just, that just breaks down in front of his eyes. And he actually himself has a nervous breakdown, in fact, a series of nervous breakdowns. Um, And I think it's it's probably correct to say that that Tillich really lives through um, the death of the 19th century in the trenches there. Um, So he comes back to Berlin, 1919, after this experience. Um, And he's confronted by two things, one of which is very personal, and the other one which is much more... Um, cultural. First is that his, um, his wife is pregnant uh, with another man's son. So uh, that initial um, uh, fa- familial situation comes to an end. Um, the other man, it's worth noting, was um, one of his best friends, Richard Wegener. Um, but uh, an amicable divorce is arranged 
Um, and uh, Tillich then throws himself as a, as a young man coming back after the First World War into Weimar Republic Berlin. He throws himself into that kind of uh, you know, avant-garde, radical, wild, cultural moment um, uh, after, after the First World War. Um, and say so that, that cultural moment for Tillich is something which is not just a kind of post-war reaction, but is culturally, religiously, theologically significant. Yeah? He sees this as being a moment of opportunity after the breakdown of the previous certainties of the 19th century. So rather than some of the more sceptical, conservative reactions amongst the theologians, he sees that new cultural moment as being something of theological importance. And that is probably best summed up by the notion of uh, expressivism or expressionism. Yeah? This kind of cultural moment where all of the fixed certainties are shaken up and the deep meanings are allowed to come through. You see this in, in, in visual arts, uh, revolutions from the kind of impressionistic, um, sort of safe bourgeois um, certainties to these radical, um, disruptive forms of German expressionism in particular, and cubism, futurism, all of these moments. You see it in, in modern dance, in film, architecture, um, and of course also in philosophy. And for Tillich, this, this is a, a moment for a new form of theology. Um, just to go back to the, some of the biography here, um, uh, in a way, in the midst of all this, Tillich meets uh, his, his second wife, uh, Hannah, um, at a fancy dress party, uh, which sort of sets the tone for their, their relationship from the, that point on. Um, Hannah is a fiery, independent-minded uh, character, and there's a lot of controversy, a lot that's been written about their relationship. But I think if we say that they met in 1920 at a fancy dress party in a Berlin nightclub, uh, they both had previous partners, um, that kind of sets the scene for their relationship. Um, whatever, whatever we want to say, and people have made all sorts of judgments, they, they remained together for the rest of their lives. Uh, Tillich, in the year before he died, he said that only Hannah understood me. Um, and even in spite of some of the subsequent public, public, public no, sorry, published um, uh, words that, that she herself wrote, I think she came to realise that they were, they were sort of one of a kind or two of a kind together, really. Um, anyway, so on his return to Berlin, apart from attending fancy dress parties, Tillich did teach a bit of philosophy and theology. He got a job in the uh, in University of Berlin um, and developed there uh, some of his really formative ideas that, that, that then go on to get reiterated uh, throughout his teaching career. In particular, he's concerned to teach uh, philosophy, the history of philosophy, um, and, and the history of theology in, uh, always in, in the context of the cultural situation. Um, and he develops here what is perhaps his most distinctive idea, which is the notion of theology of culture. This is first put forward explicitly in a lecture that he gives in 1919 to the Kant Society of Berlin. Um, quite what the Kantians thought of this is uh, unsure, but um, he, he developed this idea. And so the, the, the lecture is called the On the Idea of the Theology of Culture. And he basically sets out and says that one must not uh, accept any kind of separation between the religious life and the cultural life. And he says that when he came back from the war, he found that there was this polarization, that you had this very radical, dynamic cultural situation, and you had then this kind of official, 
conservative, reactionary, religious life. Yeah? And rather, uh, and the problem was that th these two just weren't coming together, weren't talking to each other. So that rather, theology must always be done in and through uh, its cultural context. Um, he, say, this, this is something that, that, that he then develops further throughout his career. Um, I think it's worth just at this point noting uh, uh, a couple of the kind of key concepts that, 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 that he identifies at this point. The first is that, so the first is, is, is his understanding of religion. And this really is fundamental, it's basic to understanding Tillich. He, he distinguishes effectively between two uh, forms of religion or two definitions of religion. On the one hand, we have a kind of narrow, official notion of religion which um, identifies religion with specific traditions, specific confessions, and the specific ideas that go along with those. Yeah. The second notion of religion is a much broader understanding. And here we start to get some of Tillich's own kind of key notions. Yeah? He talks about uh, religion as uh, directedness towards the ultimate, yeah? towards the unconditioned. Uh, the idea that religion is about our response to that which transcends our, the everyday. Um, he talks about the idea of uh, um, ultimate concern, yeah? so that religion isn't fertilic to be identified with a particular part of the human life, or in his words at that point in early 20th century, he talks about the human spirit. Yeah? Uh, and he identifies there uh, Kant as, identify, as, as equating religion with morality, Schleiermacher, identifying religion with feeling. Um, and he says these, these are restrictive. Yeah? Or even you know, his contemporary Bart, you know, identifying religion with the word of God, with, with some kind of uh, specified, narrowly specified form of revelation. Yeah? For Tillich, religion is about this directedness towards the ultimate. And this, this is manifest, this occurs in all forms of life, in all aspects of human existence. Yeah. So that's the first. The second 